This is the point in our service where we take some time to remember Jesus. We take some time for the Christian to remember what Christ did in their place at the cross as he suffered for their sin and purchased their salvation. In a few minutes, we're going to take a small wafer and a bit of juice. These are symbols. They're symbols of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ that were offered by Christ at the cross for those who put their trust in him. And it's important that we remember Christ well this morning. So we're going to remember Christ by looking at a passage in which he describes why it was that he came into the world. We just celebrated Christmas a week ago. We celebrated his birth. We're going to look at a passage that explains to us why it was that he was born. We're going to use his very words himself. So if you have a Bible with you, would you turn with me to John chapter 18? We're going to be looking at verses 36 and 37 together. There are some men coming down the aisles. If you don't have a Bible with you, just raise your hand and they'll get one to you. If you don't actually own a Bible and you desire to own one, please consider this as our gift to you so that you can read God's word for yourself. This, is the, this story takes place in the crucifixion story. And at this point in the crucifixion story, Jesus has been entered into the praetorium and he's there with Pilate. Our passage today is a conversation between Jesus and Pilate. Jesus has already been betrayed by Judas, and he's been tried by the Sanhedrin and by the high priests, and they had no reasonable charge against Jesus, and there was nothing that could stick to Jesus. But they desperately wanted to get rid of Jesus. They wanted him dead, so that they took him to Pilate, and their aim in taking him to Pilate was to convince Pilate to crucify him. Luke's account of this same story tells us that the Jews told Pilate, that Jesus claimed to be a king. And that was true. But Pilate saw that their claim and their case against Jesus didn't have much to do with Roman law. Roman law and Roman rule in Judea. So in verse 31, you see that Pilate tries to return Jesus to the Jews, but they wouldn't have it. So Pilate went back into the praetorium to examine Jesus for himself. In verse 33, when Pilate asks Jesus if he's king of the Jews, he's only thinking of this world. He's thinking about whether or not Jesus is a threat to his governance in Judea. The main question is in his mind is whether Jesus is a threat to his rule, because if Jesus is innocent of this, then his position as governor is secure. When we look at verses 34 and 35, we see that Pilate comes to understand that the problem that the Jews have with Jesus is a Jewish problem. And it's a problem that they should sort out on their own. So he ends by asking Jesus, what have you done? He's not asking this to understand what Jesus has done. He's asking this to understand what Jesus has done that's any threat to his position as ruler over Judea. He doesn't have any regard for Jesus. He doesn't have any respect for Jesus. He simply wants to examine himself and, and see whether or not he is secure. So let's read verses 36 and 37 together. This is Jesus' response to Pilate when Pilate asked him what he's done. And when we get to verse 37, let's take note of why Jesus said it was that he came into the world. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Jesus responds to Pilate, but he doesn't ask his question. And instead, he says something much more significant. He explains that he has a kingdom. And he says, my kingdom. He's speaking about a kingdom that exists, and he speaks emphatically, and he says, this kingdom is unique to me. It is my kingdom. I am the one who owns this kingdom. I am the one who will run this. This is not a kind of kingdom that Pilate cares about. It's kind of not the kind of kingdom that Pilate knows about. Pilate only cares about retaining the authority that Rome gave him in Judea. But Jesus' kingdom has nothing to do with human institution, human authority. And this is way over Pilate's head. Pilate just it doesn't really have a category for the kind of kingdom that Jesus is describing. So Jesus puts it to him plainly in verse 37, and that's where we want to focus this morning. 
Jesus says, the whole reason I was born into this world is to testify to the truth. And the truth is what I've already told you, that I'm a king and that I have a kingdom. Again, Jesus has a kingdom. It's a kingdom that he possessed at the time that he was speaking to Pilate. It just was not yet established on this earth. But when it will be established on this earth, Jesus will be the one who rules uncontested in that kingdom for a thousand years. And Jesus is in full control of the conversation here. Uh, He's being interrogated by Pilate, but he's controlling the conversation. And he doesn't end the conversation. In the last part of verse 37, he explains who will be with him in his kingdom. It's those who are of the truth. Those who believe that Jesus is a king and that he has a kingdom and he's going to reign here on this earth in that kingdom. You know, so often we think of Jesus as the atoning sacrifice the one who went to the cross and bore our sins in his body on the cross so he could satisfy God's wrath against those sins and he could secure us into his kingdom. And that is true and we want to believe that and we celebrate that this morning. But what we need to see this morning is that Jesus' work on the cross fits into the larger picture of Jesus as the Messiah in his new kingdom. Jesus reconciled sinners to God through his work on the cross so that those sinners who he purchased into his kingdom could be with him when he rules in that kingdom. And then Jesus goes on and he explains something else. He explains how you can tell who those people are. They're the people who hear his voice. Sheep in a pasture know the voice of their shepherd. Jesus' followers know his voice. And this is not some vague, ethereal, mystical voice. In the church age, it's the gospel. It's the plain and simple, clear gospel that Jesus suffered and died on the cross, bearing the sins of everybody who would trust in him in his own body and suffering God's wrath against those sins. And in so doing, he purchased those sinners into his kingdom and they would be with him when he rules and reigns. The person who knows that and understands that, understands Jesus as Savior, lives with Christ as master over them, with Lord over them for the rest of their lives. The Lord's table is for people who know Christ that way. People who understand what Christ did at the cross and who submit to his lordship in their life. So if you're here today and you understand what Christ did at the cross and you submit to his lordship over your life, you understand that he paid the penalty for your sin and you rejoice knowing that you don't need to try and satisfy God's wrath against you for your sin, and you look forward to the day that Christ is coming, then please join us in taking the elements today. When the elements come to you, hold them for a minute and consider his work on the cross, and then rejoice that his work on the cross was sufficient to purchase you into his kingdom, and that you can anticipate with joy his return when he does come again. If you're here today and you do not know Christ, you don't understand what it is that he did at the cross, you don't understand how it is that he suffered in place of those who would trust in him. And if you don't submit to his lordship over your life, you need to understand that a few things. One is we're very, very thankful you're here this morning. It is our joy that you're here with us and we're glad you're here. But know that the Lord's table is for Christians. It's those who follow their Lord and their master. So when the elements come to you, uh, just pass them to the next person. Um, But there is a door up here to my right. There will be somebody here uh, after the service. I'll be up at the uh, info table in the front. Or you could just uh, talk to the person who's next to you. Uh, Consider during the the time of communion that that Jesus' words and his claims about his kingdom. As certainly as we know that Jesus was born of a virgin, and as certainly as he lived a sinless life that qualified him to die in place of those who would trust in him, and as certainly as he did die, and as certainly as he entered into death and raised himself from the dead, and as certainly as he ascended into heaven and currently sits at the right hand of the Father petitioning for all believers that he died for, you can be sure, it's absolutely certain that he is coming again. And those that will be with him are those who have trusted in him as their Savior and as their Lord. Those will be the only people, those who spend the rest of their life here not receiving him, not accepting him, not submitting to his lordship over their life, they will spend an eternity in a lake of fire. So I encourage you, don't leave today without having a conversation with somebody about what it means to follow Christ. So men, come and serve us, and I'll be back in a couple minutes to close our time in prayer.